It was very cold last February. Absurdly cold. I was a paper delivery boy in Ohio, doing some part-time work to pay for my house rent as a college student. Last February, a storm dumped five inches of snow over the town. Everything in sight was white and frosty. On my way to the post office, I saw a small black and white cat tied to a lamp post with an elongated choker. Its large eyes darted around frantically, like it was waiting to be rescued by its owner. I cycled away, minding my own business. Surely its owner would have been in the newsagent shop nearby, stopping for a can of beer or something. They should come back for the cat soon, I thought. Anyway, who the hell even walked their cat? It must have been a kid. After doing my paper round, it was time for college. It had been three hours since I'd started the round for that day. Thus, I expected the cat I saw in the morning to be gone by then. However, as I approached the lamp post, I could see from a distance that it was still there. I couldn't help feeling worried about the situation. It was bitterly cold, and the temperature was dipping to the negatives. The cat was pacing around the lamp post horridly, almost desperately. Two days later, it was still there. Nobody had came back for it. Perhaps it had been abandoned. Concerned about its welfare, I decided to take it into my house and rehome it comfortably. It wasn't ideal as I hadn't ever had any sort of experience with pets before, but at least it would stop suffering unnecessarily in the cold. It would be provided with food and a place to sleep. I cut the string that tied it, then took it in, and pasted posters on the lamp and fences around town reading Lost Cat Found, with additional contact details. The cat didn't like to eat very much. It had a huge, painful-looking scar on its belly where the skin had been sewn together, perhaps from an operation. When it did eat, however, it swallowed its whole food in large chunks. This prompted me to cut the food up into smaller bits to prevent it from choking. During the day, it would pace around my house and jump on the furniture, meowing and purring. But during the night, it would always come into my room and sit in front of my bed. It seemed to be a well-learned habit. If I didn't let it into the bedroom, it would continually scratch on the door until I gave in and opened it. On the first night it stayed in my room, I was woken up by the sound of light clicking. I wasn't sure whether it was actually clicking or tapping or ticking, but it sounded like something mechanical. I figured the source of the noise was probably the keys hanging from my trouser pocket, tapping the edge of the bed. I sat up a little, and the noise stopped. I nearly had a heart attack when I saw the two green shining eyes staring right at me in the darkness. They were wide open and glowed like phosphorus. A heartbeat later, I calmed down a little after I realized it was just the cat. But it still felt extremely uncomfortable, being pinned down by those eyes in the dead of night. I lay down and tried my best to dismiss it constantly eyeing the silhouette perching on the foot of my bed. Even though I felt like a cowardly five-year-old, I didn't want to close my eyes knowing that another pair of eyes was watching me as I slept. Half a minute later, the eyes relaxed a little, and I saw the cat blink and move. It started to stroll naturally around the room again, so I brushed it off and went back to sleep. But every night or so after that, I would wake up to the same fading clicking noise. Every time I woke up, I found the cat staring straight at me. But then, it would break eye contact and walk away once it realized I was conscious. I found the behavior slightly strange, but I reckoned it was just shy and wanted to observe some human behavior rather than falling snow for a change. Besides, cats are nocturnal animals, right? Except for the dodgy eating habits and the midnight staring, which were only minor concerns, 
My new friend caused me no trouble. My house came with a cat flap in the front door. The landlord had a cat. I could let this cat in and out of the house freely. It didn't attack any of the neighbor's pets or vandalize any property. It didn't bite people or bring me dead birds and rats. It didn't even leave piss or shit around the house. My cat was a good cat. It had been a month, but no one had called to claim the cat. I decided to legitimately make it mine and gave it a new name, Scotty. I wasn't sure whether Scotty was male or female, but it didn't matter much to me. The act of naming him or her itself counted as a bonding ritual, a gateway to a beautiful friendship between two different species, forged by mutual care. From then on, Scotty was my source of comfort. When my exams weren't going well, when I was having a bad day, or whether I had an argument, I would always tell Scotty, even though he was just a cat and probably didn't understand the bullshit that I was going through, or even my language as a matter of fact, I could always count on him to cheer me up. Things were getting weird around the time Scotty had been taken in. I kept questioning everything I did, because at first, I reckoned the strange occurrences were due to my own carelessness. Some days when I arrived at home, the door would be unlocked. It seemed odd, because I always locked the door when I went out, and I rarely forget to do so. I suspected a burglary, but I second-guessed myself often. Perhaps the burglar had gotten hold of my spare keys. I checked in the garage, but they were still there, still where I put them. Furthermore, nothing had been stolen. I once left two fifty-dollar notes blatantly visible on my desk, but they hadn't been taken. That's why I was hesitant to call the police. The scariest fucking thing greeted me when I got up one morning. A note was left besides my pillow, written in a messy, screwy handwriting I did not recognize. It read, Did you sleep well, Brian? I was watching you. I suddenly panicked and wondered who it was. How did they know my name? All the windows had been locked tightly before I'd gone to sleep. And I'd locked the doors too. I checked everything twice. There couldn't have been an intruder. Then I remembered. There was one other living thing in this house besides me. But surely Scotty couldn't have written it. It must have been my crazy imagination, obviously. I knew cats didn't know English. And couldn't write. Was I dreaming? Was I going insane? But if it wasn't Scotty, then who was it? My subconscious mind. There was no evidence of a break-in. If I showed the police, they'd just think I was an attention-seeking note forger who had nothing better to do than prank them. But I was sure I had not written that note. There was no way out of this. Hours of sweat dripping fear later, and after checking all the windows and doors had been locked multiple times, I told myself I would play along with it, to give myself some comfort at least. If it was a dream, I would wake up and curse myself for being so stupid and gullible. But for now, I would believe it, because it was the only explanation. I spoke to Scotty in English, feeling stupid. Don't scare me like that, Scotty, okay? You know I'm faint of heart. He just meowed back. He wasn't going to communicate with me verbally. Well. He is a cat, after all, so I figured it would be easier if I wrote a message back on paper. It would allow for some distance. Who are you? How do you know me? I wrote. I left it besides my bed. The next day, my note was replaced with another phantom message. My name is Scotty. Of course I know you. 
I watch you day and night. I shook my head and opened my mouth in disbelief as I finished reading the note. Then I patted myself on the back for outsmarting natural human narrow-mindedness. The supernatural was real. Of course, as you can imagine, I was terrified for a few moments. I wondered if I would ever come to terms with the fact that my cat was sending me messages, written on pieces of paper in English. Then, I wondered if it was such a bad thing after all. Perhaps I could use this to my advantage. To talk to the entire animal kingdom or discover some crucial biological breakthrough. Could all animals understand human language like Scotty? If they could, then... No. I was thinking too far ahead. Right now, all I needed to know was that everything I ever told Scotty, all of my hopes and fears and desires, they had been understood and taken into account. Another being had shared my pain. Scotty understood me. Suddenly I no longer felt so isolated. Maybe people would think I was crazy, writing messages to my cat. But as long as I knew it was real, there was nothing to worry about. There was a being in this world I could really talk to. I tapped my assignment into my computer as I waited for Scotty to come down from my room, thinking about this prospect. I drank my coke and spun around on my wheelie chair, simultaneously pushing the table. I really did have a friend after all, I thought, smiling to myself. Suddenly, I heard the cracking sound, followed by a loud clack and the sound of something popping. Some hard object obstructed the back wheel of my chair. I felt it bulging beneath me, immediately looking down to see what that obstruction was. I cried out in devastation and horror. It was Scotty. The wheel of my chair had rolled onto his neck and severed his head. It lay detached from his body on the floor. His arms twitched and his body convulsed. My instant reaction was fear and guilt. He had been so silent. But despite that, how on earth did I not see him there? I thought he was still in my room. Then, Scotty twitched for the final time, and finally lay still as a rock. Then it dawned on me. I had just killed my best friend with one careless back roll. It was all my fault. I began to cry and call out his name, the shame overwhelming me. But ten seconds later, I stopped stopped in confusion. There was no blood. I bent down to observe the body. My eyebrows curved as I saw something black and silver inside his body. Something that definitely shouldn't have been inside a cat's body. The silver things rotated and seemed to have teeth. Were they gears? No way. What the hell were mechanical gears doing inside a cat? I picked up the body gingerly, and suddenly, I saw a network of metal inside his body. I looked down at his neck. His neck bone was a single metal screw-like rod. His ribs were metal. He seemed to have no internal organs. But there was a pinkish fleshy tint surrounding the metal. I shuddered, and then similarly picked up his head. There were twisting red and yellow spirally things coming out from the bottom of his head. Wires to Jesus Christ. I couldn't see his brain, but 
I could see the inside of his skull, which was made out of metal. I could also see between the metal, and I saw real pinkish flesh. I must have had drugs. What the hell was going on? Then I tried something absurd. I placed his head on top of the metal screw protruding from the stump that used to be his neck. To my horror, I felt something lock into place. I twisted his head, and it gradually lowered, as if I was tightening a screw. Soon, Scotty looked as if he hadn't just been killed. One of his eyes rotated to look at me. I shrieked in shock and dropped him. I didn't care if this was real or not, a hallucination or a nightmare. Perhaps the whole thing was just one big delusional dream, and in real life, I was actually some insane crack addict. I remember that day. I honestly wished that I was. I just wanted to get away from the monstrosity I had seen, and bolted outside, locking the door. I called the emergency services. Hello? Yes? Um, I think my cat's an android. To my irritation, they sent an ambulance. It was a blatant slap in the face saying, there's something wrong with this guy. To be completely honest, I shouldn't have been as shocked or offended as I was then. My claim didn't seem very valid, now that I think about it. But I really did hope that it was just me being a crazy bastard. Scotty looked and felt so real. He did everything a normal cat would do. How on earth did this happen? Okay. He might have had some behavioral problems, but... I begged them to go inside and see for themselves. I pointed at Scotty, standing beside the wheelie of the chair. One of the guys picked up Scotty. Scotty didn't move, and I could tell suspicions were growing. Unable to stand it any longer, I grabbed the cat's body and unscrewed its head. The paramedics suddenly turned white. When they eventually discovered I was telling the truth, the police were finally called to my place. I told them everything. About how I'd taken Scotty in, about the notes beside my pillow. They planned on doing all sorts of ridiculous things, such as suing the pet company I bought him from. They soon ruled out that one for obvious reasons. I insisted they told me what was going on, and that they carried out a proper investigation into my case. I slept in a hotel for three days, even in the company of the busy holiday makers and staff, I still felt like I was being watched. I would often wake up several times in the night, in a cold sweat, expecting to see those two green eyes again. I received a phone call from the police yesterday. They told me to meet them outside of my property. They had called my landlord too. We asked them what they had found. They told us that the house had been broken into. When they searched it, they heard something smashing in the garage. Someone had escaped out the garage window when they smelt the police present. The perpetrator left behind a bloodied knife, a murder weapon and something else. The police showed it to us. It was a little like a tablet, but had two small rods of antennae. It was stored in one of those transparent crime scene evidence packets, but it had a touch screen, which could still be used through the material. There were buttons on the screen. The cop pointed at another packeted bit of evidence. Scotty. He was stiff as a doornail and did not move inside the packet. The cop pressed the green button, and to my surprise, Scotty meowed, and he pressed another button, and Scotty lifted his leg. But the most disturbing of all was the screen display between the buttons. The cop went over and lifted Scotty's body up, so that his eyes were looking directly at me through the layer of plastic. My face and everything behind me appeared on the screen on the tablet. 
there were many files saved on the menu of the tablet. All were named Sleeping 1 or Sleeping 2 or Sleeping dot some other number. They contained stored night vision footage of me sleeping. The incision in Scotty's belly had been made to insert a complicated system of robotic mechanical features into the body of an already dead cat, which could be controlled using the device. The new robot cat was made as realistic as possible, and could move with the fluidity and agility of a living cat if the user was skilled. The eyes acted as windows for the cat and the user. Each button controlled a command. There was also a complex code inside each command, which the user could edit accordingly. I started to sweat. I realized that someone or something had understood my ranting, had understood my fears, hopes, and dreams. But it wasn't Scotty. And that someone or something hiding in my garage had been watching me sleep. Again. It wasn't Scotty. Waves of dread came upon me. The cop handed me one final specimen in a plastic bag. It was a note. In the same messy handwriting I assumed was Scotty's, left beside my pillow. It was found after the police took Scotty away. Ha ha. Joke's on you. Scotty hadn't written that. <laughs>